want to talk about words for a minute. Words, hushed utterances, intermittent iterations of interruptions of the eternal, internal silence. Language, sounds, noises we string together to communicate with one another. Words contain meaning. For instance, if I say the word dog, Ruff. dog is just a noise that I'm making, a combination of three specific sounds, d-a-g, 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 dog, dog, dog. To a non-English speaker, this word has no meaning. It is meaningless. But to you, O oh beautiful listener, this sound holds information. The word dog calls to mind a myriad of data. Anything from dogs you may have had previously, to your opinion of dogs, to your favorite breed of dog or perhaps more experiential data, the feeling of running your hand through soft fur, the instinctive jolt you feel upon hearing a surprise bark, the synthetic smell of dog food, the feeling of being licked, or perhaps just the sense of emotional connection you feel to a furry friend. All these and more are available depending on the context around the word dog. And that's another feat I find fascinating. Sentences. Nothing but a collection of words. Right? Maybe. Take a sentence as words and their individual meanings and put them in a box. This box should hold a sentence, and maybe sometimes it does. But more often than not, it takes a mind to assemble a new meaning. The words combined meaning. The sentences meaning. Sentences are more than the sum of their parts. This is most easily seen in sentences that express meaning that extends beyond their words, such as idioms. Barking up the wrong tree has nothing to do with trees or their bark or barking. Yet when spoken to most native speakers, a coherent message is conveyed using that combination of words. You may be surprised how common idiom usage is. Another example of sentences being greater than the sum of their parts is sentences that contain emotional expression. Analyze them individually all you want, but you will never generate the feeling you experience when the true recognition of these words touches the core of your being. I... I love you. Powerful stuff. I'll do more on that later. But let's go beyond theory for a minute. I want to play with how you hear words. Does how you hear what I'm saying influence how you interpret my meaning? First, there's the obvious. My words can flex volume from normal to soft. Don't worry, I won't be loud. My words can be slow, or they can pick up some speed and perhaps inspire a little bit of a hurried, anxious feeling as I'm speaking so fast that you possibly worry about the oxygen depleting because you cannot find another reason for me to be speaking this rapidly. Huh. My voice could be obstructed or partially obstructed. Or perhaps you can hear me from inside a boxed room. 
Some might call this a cell. You can hear me through both ears. Through one ear. But let's confuse you for a minute. Let's find a button here. Where is it? Oh, right here. Okay. The locational consistency modular. Most of the noises you hear from people are perceivable from a generally solid source. That doesn't imply there is no motion, just that you can generally anticipate what you're going to hear, or rather, how you're going to hear it. Let's toss that out the window for just a moment. And... Engage. What I just did there is make it so that my location around you is no longer coherent. Consider as a metaphor the idea that there are an infinite number of parallel realities. Each one where I am speaking to you from somewhere else and you are shifting through them very rapidly. How do you feel? Does this change the way you're interpreting my words? Does it make me easier or harder to understand? Is it pleasant? Is it confusing? Is it taxing? I may be moving, but where are you? In the center of the universe. Okay, that's enough of that. I like also that we have degrees of words. When said genuinely, a thanks differs from a thank you, or even up to a thank you very much. Same root, different meaning. If you're ever feeling particularly bored, Take note, do your best to note is what you are saying. If you dig deep enough, you'll generally find reasons for saying most of the things you do. For instance, it has been said before that people tend to express themselves more often using language relating to their primary or preferred sense. I enjoy using sound and music to reference my place in the world. So I often use phrases like, sounds like, music to my ears. I hear you. That rings a bell. Broken record. Ooh, that strikes a chord in me. It really resonates with me. You know, jazz it up, all that jazz. Really changes my tune. No need to drum up any more examples. I think I'm good with those. Your language centers related to your native tongue are very old. This was the way that you initially began to express yourself and interface with the world. But in so being, it's very indicative of patterns that can cycle within you. The way you speak and the things you say can be very revealing about the unconscious processing within you. If you're ever curious about why you do the things you do, tune up your self-awareness for a bit and observe what you say and how you say it. If you discover things inside you that you do not prefer, change them. Also, just to be clear, your talk towards others is important. But perhaps more important is the talk you offer yourself. We all have ways of understanding ourselves and our relation to the world. And the stories that we tell ourselves are very key to the intrinsic assimilation of your life. The vocabulary and metaphors, the symbolism and characters are all pretty telling of where you are and where you are headed. 
Who are you in your story? The hero? The wise one? The victim? The villain? Who or what is your primary challenge in this tale? Are you enjoying the book? Is it keeping you on the edge of your seat? Or perhaps, have you lost interest? Dulled by boredom and indifferent to the goings-on? Remember, you're writing these pages. If you aren't feeling them, then perhaps it's time for a new chapter. Read you later.